let's talk. It's Monday. Let's find out what's going on in the market. And have we hit a macro bottom for Bitcoin or not? Let's look at some of the data. Let's also talk about a little bit of the calendar for the week, some macro stuff. Are we in a recession or not? And some signs we definitely are and how the Fed may take that into account and why spinach hands may be, or lettuce hands, may be the new diamond hands. Let's go. As you know, this is always just edutainment. And let's start at the beginning. First of all, Bitcoin value transferred. A big thank you to Michael Saylor for sharing this on Twitter earlier. I thought it was a very powerful, simple little slide. This is basically, he describes the fact that all commodities require energy, but Bitcoin is a commodity. At least <laughs> change the narrative from a you know currency to a commodity, which is in line with what the SEC thinks too. And it can serve as global digital money, but Bitcoin's economic function is already providing the, the potential for property rights to 8 billion people on Earth and a global settlement network that settles really, really fast over the Lightning Network or 10 minutes through the Bitcoin Network. And it's already cleared $17 trillion this year. But look at the growth. 2020, 2.3 trillion. 2021, 13.11 trillion. And by the way, for the most of 2021, the price was a lot higher than 2022. So if you imagine the amount of Bitcoin being transferred at such a low price, it's going to be a hell of a lot higher than two times 13 trillion by the end of 2022. It'll be 26, 27, 28, 30 trillion dollars of value transfer, which is massive. It puts it on pars with some of the biggest money center banks on earth. So Interesting to look at. Now, another good news when we talk about we are early. A big thank you to Miles Deutscher for going through that report. I read it myself as well. But uh, and I pulled out this one slide. And thank you for Sanjay bringing it to my attention. Only the big takeaway here is only 0.3% of retail wealth on earth is invested in crypto. Okay. <laughs> that is about $700 billion, which is a pittance of global wealth. We are so, 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 so early. And I could talk about all the other stuff about adoption and penetration and all that stuff, but we're not going to go there just yet. But let's go a little bit further. Let's talk about the real story today. We're going to look at macro bottom signals. And there was a great article in Coin Telegraph that got my attention. And they go, we've seen much of these signs before, but we're just going to go through them again because there are some things here that do show we have bounced off a macro bottom, despite the fact many people are still calling for $12,000 Bitcoin, $13,000 Bitcoin. Um, but anyway, we'll see if they will change their narrative. Some of them are actually coming around and now talking about $28,000 Bitcoin within a week. I will not mention any names, but that's what's happening. Anyway, this looked at the Bitcoin RSI and how it was oversold. It was actually oversold on the weekly chart, and I put it together in my trading view more than any time ever in Bitcoin history. That's a little blue arrow at the bottom. Now, just going a little bit back in time, uh, again, after we're talking about that world record in oversoldness, this is the first time the RSI has slipped into uh, this region since December 2018. And remember, I threw in a little red arrow what happened in December 2018. And within six months, the Bitcoin price had gone up 340% to $14,000. Remember, it was about 3000 at the time. And that's a separate issue. But that's what happens when Bitcoin sometimes comes out of a very oversold position. It can make a big move. And remember as well, if you go from 20K to 67K, that is ballpark 340%. Just reading into numbers, that's what I do, uh, and nothing else. So I thought that was a very interesting coincidence. We don't know where we're going to go, but we'll see. Fun times. That was the first one that Cointelegraph picked up on, the RSI rebounding out of that world record oversoldness. Second one is the Nupal. This is the net unrealized profit loss indicator, and it's a sign of a typical macro bottom. Um, and you can see here, I added the red line to the chart, which is at the zero level, uh, just so you see. And these are times in the past where we had gone very deep into negative territory for the NUPL. And the just as a reminder, I think it's the difference between the market cap and the realized cap divided by the market cap, something like that. And uh, you can see here, a ratio above zero means investors are in profit. And the higher 
the, we go above that, the more they're in profit. So the point is, Bitcoin investors now, on the whole, are back in profit again. Good. So everybody feels good. And you see that as well. There's a lot less, I won't say, well, it's a happier world, put it that way. And it's a very, very good sign that it is a macro bottom. Third thing is not only are people in profit again, but miners are profitable again too. This is the Puel multiple. And it shows that uh, mining profitability is, uh, it shows the relative range of how high it is. When it's up in the red, it's super, super profitable, which also indicates a potential market top, as can be seen by the black line, which is Bitcoin price. And the orange line is a pure multiple. But we've had a brutal time right down here. Again, very similar to late 2018, December 2018. Remember that from the first slide? Now we are back down there again, but we just came out of that green zone which means the miners can make it. Now, interestingly as well, the pure multiple reading as of, I think, July 25th, it was in the green box, similar to the levels of observed back in March 2020, 2018, and 2015. All those orange times we were back in those green boxes, we just came out very positive. We never stay down for long. Remember, like holding a big beach ball underwater, you can't hold it down for long. Now, there's a little bit of bad news. So this is just to balance things out. This is not from Coit and Telegraph. This is from Glassnode. And the MVRV Z-score is typically used to assess when Bitcoin is over or undervalued relative to its fair value. And basically here it does, it did tip down. I added a little red arrow in the bottom right there. And we've gone back into this territory, which typically means it is extremely undervalued. But just dipping down below zero again is maybe not a good sign, not a good trend to be in. Considering everything else is going up, this one is tweaked down. So again, three out of four ain't bad or whatever the song is. Anywho, the other thing as well to notice is, and I've been hinting at this a few times, lettuce hands are the new diamond hands. I used to call them spinach hands, but I found this little meme online. And uh, you know what I've noticed as well over the past couple of months, you can make a lot more money trading uh, by getting in and getting out, scalping, day trading, et cetera, than just buying and holding. But if you are into buying and holding, there's nothing wrong with that because this is an exceptionally good time to buy because it is number go up technology. And again, as I said many times before, even if no more money comes into the ecosystem for Bitcoin, it will go up because the denominator is debasing and we win by not losing. Remember that. So holding is not necessarily a good thing. That was the other big learning from this market. Now, Citibank, Citigroup, uh, reported here 2.2 uh, trillion, billion, whatever that number is. Banking giant says crypto contagion has likely passed. And that's another uh, big firm, big analysis has come out and said, okay, the worst is behind us. Start, I think Sam Bankman-Fried was the first one to put a line in the sand and say, this is now behind us. And this came from, I think the analyst is Mr. Ayub, And he said that contagion is most likely over words to that effect. So good news. Now, there's a couple of big releases this week that we need to keep a look on and uh, see exactly what's going on. So tomorrow, big, big earnings day, big names, uh, Alphabet, which is Google, which in full disclosure, I own. None of the others I do, but uh, they're big names that are coming out and they will set the tone for what the market does. Uh, July 27th, durable goods orders, which will be crappy. Pending home sales, which will be crappy. The FOMC interest rate decision, which probably will be 75 basis points. And Meta, who cares? Qualcomm, I don't know. We'll see some other big names are coming out as well. And data from ADP, which is also very important to look at. And then July 28th, uh, GDP, which will tell us we are in a recession. But it's okay. We've got some good news about that, actually. We will not be in a recession, according to some people. And then PC price index, etc. August 1st. I uh, Sam, it's hard to believe we're already moving into August already. And remember, uh, two months ago, I said it'll be about 90 days before we get out of this storm. We're coming out of it real fast. And August could be the time when the market's really, you know, August typically a quiet month, but it could be a time when we start really going up and people start layering in. Now, Dr. Doom was out though. Dr. Doom is uh, uh, Nouriel Rubini, and he has won a Nobel Prize, etc. Smart fellow, hates Bitcoin, but 
uh, sometimes, you know, uh, we find ourselves agreeing with people that sometimes aren't fully aligned in everything that we believe in. But he uh, talked about the stag stagflationary um, environment we could be going into, uh, previous recessions like the last two. We had massive monetary and fiscal easing. This time around, we're going to QT. So there's no real way to move. Uh, he also spoke about stagflationary negative aggregate supply shocks, debt ratios that are historically high. And uh, he thinks we're going to have a very, very severe landing as we go forward, which is not good. But he thinks it's going to be a recession and it's going to be nasty. It's not going to be shallow. It's not going to be short-lived. It's going to be brutal. So I think he's always errs a little bit more on the side of being super, super negative. I think it'll be somewhere in between. But the good news is the White House has a plan. So this is from Janet Yellen. And I know uh, she was talking with Chuck Todd. And she said, well, no, they were talking about the definition of a recession. And the technical definition is two quarters of contraction. And she said, no, that's no longer a recession. So I won't dwell on that. But the point is, White House knows GDP numbers already. They get a leak way ahead of time. They know they're going to be bad. They know we're in a recession. So now it's time to redefine what a recession is just to keep everybody cool and keep the people elected in office in office so they don't lose their jobs. So that's called moving the goal, goalposts. Um, in other news as well, this is from Equinometrics. At its most basic level, this shows you where the real yield is, and it is deeply, deeply negative. And a quick reminder for those who don't know what the real yield is, these are returns that a, anybody investing in a bond earns from interest payments after accounting for inflation. And they're way, way, way below 6%, 7%. So ugly, ugly times out there. A lot of weird stuff going on in the macro. But there's still a lot of money sloshing around the system, and it needs to find a home. Now, Walmart, in bad news, uh, they just lowered their full-year profit outlook, and the stock is tanking after hours. It's down about $10 or more. Uh, about 8 or 9%, and the recession is definitely in. The Fed needs to see this. Retail is hurting. Retail customers have stopped spending, and uh, Walmart is hurting. This is also going to drag down Amazon and other retailers, and they believe their earnings will fall 10 to 12% for the full year. And they said things like food inflation is weighing on the cust customer's ability to spend elsewhere. Basically, people have to buy food, but, and they're not buying anything else. They're not buying flat panel TVs or clothing and stuff like that. They're just putting bread on the table. It is a tough, hard time. Recession is no good for, or inflation is no good for anybody. And that's what's happening right now. So uh, that will have a big impact. And we need to look very carefully at all the earnings this week. Last week, we got away easy. Companies did quite well. This week, not so good so far. And uh, it's important to look at some of the big tech names because we look at a lot of disruptive technology here as well. Now, Google is another name that has earnings coming out. And I just want to spend a second on what a cash machine this is. <laughs> it's kind of stunning. This is how much cash Google has on the balance sheet. $133.97 billion. Last time I did, looked at this analysis, Apple had the most cash on the balance sheet, about $140 billion or something, but they've divested a lot. Now they're far lower. Apple, I think, is the pink number there, about $51 billion. But think of that, $134 billion, and that's debasing at 14% per year. Shocking. But that's not the point I want to make here. I want to talk about how cheap Google is. And they may get hit tomorrow as well, with uh, depending on how earnings are. But today, they are valued at 19.6 times earnings, 5.4 times sales. They have a 15x cash flow ratio, and the price to book is 5.6x. This is the cheapest Google has been in over 10 years that I remember. So we are in extreme value territory, and things, things like Google still make money. Yes, they'll have a little less uh, marketing ad revenue, uh, because that's the first thing that a lot of big customers cut back on is marketing. Um, not sales, marketing first. So they will be hit by that. But even at that, even if earnings are a little bit down, they will still be a very strong value. And a little bit of bad news as well. Before we wrap for today, Russia uh, news out uh, from CNBC I heard today, they cut the gas flow into Germany by 80%. 
So if you look here, um, they originally cut it down to 40% and then just cut another 50%. So they've limited to, to 20% of overall flow. And that is shocking. So this will bring about, obviously, gas rationing. And Germany has no chance but to build up supplies not to make it through winter. So something desperate needs to happen. I feel for the people over there in Europe, this does not only affect Germany, but the whole of the EU. And rationing energy is rationing productivity. So this is going to really, really make what is the recession that exists in the US and definitely in Europe as well, worse, I'm afraid to say. So buckle in, everybody. Some bumpy rides ahead still, but hopefully they can figure out a way to not be so dependent on Russian gas uh, going forward. So that's it for today. Quick one. Big thank you to everybody here. Thank you to the moderators on the channel. And I'll see you all tomorrow for Okta, our famous TA Tuesday session. So thanks all.